Hey guys, Josh here to let you know that Interbrews now has a Patreon page. That's right, you can lend your support to the podcast that's been going seven years strong, bringing you the best and brightest of the craft beer scene here in Houston and beyond. And as a bonus, as a Patreon subscriber, you can get exclusive episodes of the show. That's right, we'll be doing some special interviews and episodes just for you, our supporters. So thank you so much. If you've loved the show, which I hope that is you if you're listening, then uh, head on over to patreon.com slash interbrews or interbrews.com slash Patreon or anywhere you see the link. Head on over and lend us your support so that we can keep bringing you the show and make it bigger and better than ever. We appreciate it. Now, on to the show. The following is a presentation of Stewed Productions. Hi, this is Randy Mosier, and you're listening to Interbrews. This is Interbrews. Yes, you are. Randy, good morning, sir. Good morning, Josh. How are you doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing really well, doing really good. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you on Interbrews. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It was um, fun to get on and talk. Yes, for... Uh, the listeners out there that are not um, super duper uber beer nerds uh, that don't read all the books, uh, maybe you don't know Randy right off the bat. But uh, for most people that listen to this podcast, uh, of course, you've you've heard of Randy probably what I guess tasting beer is uh, probably I guess probably is that your biggest book, I guess. Tasting oh, yeah. beer, And then yep. um, one that I don't see get as much love as I would like to see get as much love is the beer for all seasons. I love yeah. that gives me good feels. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun little book. That was a publisher request. They wanted something fun and small and gifty. And we find it's kind of a, a good way in for people to get started with beer. You know, I tried to not go on and on. But, uh, you know, I, I here we're in Chicago. We've got snow on the ground. We're looking for a little bit more over the weekend. And, uh, you know, I do like it's doppel box season for me right now. So, uh you know, I do like I do like changing the beers up with the seasons a little bit. Not sure I could ever live in Florida. Yeah, so. same thing here in Houston. We have uh, two seasons. It's hot and then not quite as hot. Um, yeah. With about two weeks of cold, so it's it's. Yep. I think it's in at the forties here today, and that, I mean everybody's, yeah. you know, ready for it to be done. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, you know, we can handle the heat, but that uh, it drops below fifty, and everybody starts questioning life. So um, oh yeah, thin blood down there. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're in Chicago. I have to ask a yes. couple of things right off the bat. Uh, one, uh, White Sox or Cubs? You know, I'm not much of a sports guy, but I will say that most of my beer pals are Sox fans. Okay, because they they lived on the south side they went to uc so my hardcore baseball fa- fans that i know they're mostly Sox people but um okay okay is that um is that in the beer is there a correlation there in the chicago beer scene and, and Sox fans is that uh they skew mostly to that side or is that uh... oh i don't know you know i just try and stay out of all of that <laughs> yeah politics right <laughs> yeah i know there's a there's a homebrew club i think it's in rio de janeiro that has two soccer teams and the club has two colors of shirts depending upon which soccer team you're a fan of but it's not that extreme up here people are just you know more focused on the beer i think okay good now well i will say now um and you say you're not as big of a sports fan so i guess the bears uh you know the the loss that they had in the playoffs just recently with the missed field goal uh that's a that's a heartbreaking way to lose. That's that's what sports will do for you. Yeah, to you. right. I mean, so. we're we were happy to make the playoffs, uh, the Texans, but we got beat soundly from the very <laughs> beginning. So it's like we were able to wrap our minds around it emotionally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's like we're both at, we're both in the same place. You know, once you calculate it all, but man, that's a that's an emotional uh, emotional sting. Uh, yeah, you way. know Chicago's used to that. I think people have a pretty uh, sanguine attitude. It was it was nice when the Cubs won the series a couple of years ago or whenever that was. And but uh, you know honestly, when a team's doing really well, it just completely ruins the news and dominates everything. And I'm uh, you know I'm a beer guy, not a sports guy. So uh, for me, it's just a lot of noise. Yeah. Well, I will say um, when you do have beer to fall back on even if you're both I, I would say i'm more of a beer person at this point in my life i used to be more of a sports guy but then i discovered beer and then it's like oh mm-hmm. <laughs> this is amazing so yeah um yeah it's like okay my team can lose but then i have a beer so it's like right yeah you know, things are good uh, yeah 
so I have to ask you, you've, you've been in the craft beer world and the beer world. Uh, I don't know. It seems like forever. How, how did uh, all this come about initially? You know, it's a long and winding path. Uh, like so many people, I got into home brewing. I went to college in Cincinnati in the early 70s. And at that time, when I, when I got there, there were still four regional or local old school breweries down there. So, and we used to go down to the dock at Shaneling and buy Little Kings at the dock. And, you know, so I guess we had, I had this sense from early on that yeah, I guess there could be some variety in beer, you know, and that was still when companies like Schlitz were making Bach beer in February. And, uh, you know, so it was like a little tiny bit of hope you know, or just this like thought in my mind. And then, you know, a friend and I got it, had talked about home brewing forever. And eventually we just pulled the trigger and bought a kit and made uh, two really completely disgusting batches of beer. <laughs> Turns out that little packet of glued together yeast like taffy on the top of the rusty can is probably not going to be all that viable for making beer. <laughs> uh, but we, nobody told us, you know, we didn't know. So eventually after I think batch four was pretty good, and by batch seven was all grain. And by that point, we were going down to the library and taking out professional brewing textbooks and copying huge things. And I was making worksheets and piling up this pile of paperwork. And I was lucky enough to run into a guy named Charles Finkel, who uh, ran a uh, company called Merchant Duvan, which was uh, really the first people – in the country to figure out how to sell a $10 six pack. Mm -hmm. And this is when Bud was a dollar 69. Mm. So the guy was a, um, you know, a real, um, one of the core founders of what we would see as craft beer, even though he was really primarily a, uh, an importer at the time. They, he and his wife eventually started Pike Brewing. But at any rate, he, he published my first book. He used to bring me out to Seattle. Um, you know, Michael Jackson staying in the bedroom upstairs. I'm in the basement. So it was kind of just a really awesome way to get, to get started. And uh, that was my first book in 1991, I think that was, Brewer's Companion. Okay. And that kind of got my foot in the door and got me to think about maybe doing more. And, you know, I started really writing a lot of articles and giving talks and, and researching beer styles. And, you know, eventually one thing led to another. And I started doing a column for All About Beer and uh, eventually contemplated another book. And, you know, and then and then somewhere. Well, so, so I'm trained as a graphic designer. That's been my career. I still I'm working on that today for a local brewery uh, that's not one of my own. And um so I got involved. I knew people from the a BJCP scene who were who were starting up small breweries, and so they had graphic design, and I was starting to freelance at that time. And so uh, you know, one thing led to another. So I did a lot of beer labels, mostly from in Chicago, but you know, I've had clients in Denmark and Brazil and 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 sort of all over. Uh, but um, that got me into the professional world a little bit, even though uh, sort of obliquely you know, by way of marketing and branding and design. And then um, started teaching for the Siebel Institute. You know, Ray, Ray Daniels moved to town, uh, uh, and we started doing a lot of work together. And, in, in, of course, he's the guy that eventually founded the uh, Cicerone uh, certification program uh, for uh, people who want to get uh, sort of a sommelier type certification. So he and I did a lot of things together. He published Radical Brewing when he was at the Brewers Association. And, and uh, you know, so it's just been this sort of leapfrogging around from one thing to another, to another, to another. The Tasting Beer started life as a course for the Siebel Institute. Hmm. It was a two-day class, and I taught that material for probably a year and a half or two years before I had the idea that that might really be a pretty good base for for a, a book on the subject to, to cover everything kind of um, equally and in a really structured way. And I think it helped that I taught that material for a couple of years and that really gets your gets your story straight, gets the flow straight, cuts trims out all the extraneous stuff. You can see when people's eyes are glazing over, <laughs> you know, and just how much detail you need. So so that was a good way to go on that. Yeah, I, I remember seeing this um a poster, I, I think it was back in fifth grade, uh, mm -hmm. that the teacher had that said, uh, I don't remember the percentages, but it's uh, something like, uh, you learn, you know, 25% of what you hear, uh, you learn 50% of what you say, uh, I don't know, 75% of what you repeat and then like 95% of what you teach. So it's like the best way to learn something is to, to teach it, I guess would be the, the take home message from that 
sign in Mrs. Keith's uh, <laughs> fifth grade class. But um, yeah, no, it totally is. I mean, you want to learn about something because you start. You have to question yourself. You 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 find yourself writing something down or saying it. it's like, well, I've always thought that, but do I really know it's true? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what you have to do when you're writing a book too, because there's so many things that you've just sort of piled into your knowledge base over the year mm-hmm. that you read somewhere you can't remember where or people were saying, you know. And there's all kinds of stuff like that. So it's really and it's kind of hard to really challenge deeply held long standing understandings of things just because you know it's it's just hard to die, dig into a little, every little thing and that's one of the reasons why you, you always uh send the book out to uh technical people and they give it you know give a kind of a second like are you really sure about that it's like hmm, well i thought i was but maybe i'm not so um and then at some point along the way i i met a woman in a bar she turned out to be the wife of my now partner at five rabbit cerveceria mm-hmm. and she told me this cool story about how she and her husband and another partner were going to start a latin american themed craft brewery probably in chicago and uh you know i started talking to them and eventually they decided they wanted me on board as a partner and then several years later sort of a similar kind of thing i get a phone call from from somebody who wanted to start a uh what turned out to be a botanical brewery um and called forbidden root yeah so uh, so now i'm i'm embedded i got my fingers on all you know I not, i'm not home brewing anymore i took all my homebrew stuff and took it down to five rabbit and now it's the pilot system down there mm. uh, but i'm doing a lot of recipe work i'm still pretty engaged in all of that stuff but i'm doing it you know now as with a perspective as a as a craft brewer um, day to day, I mean, with, uh, your, and you're still, uh, consulting and, and with both breweries, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm actually a partner. Part- of both breweries. Right. So like day to day, do you split your time between each one? Do you spend, uh, like Tuesday, Thursday with one and then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, are you at the other or how, how does that work? Uh, uh- uh, well, I go down, I go to each brewery once, at least once a week for meetings and sometimes twice. Okay. And then uh, most of the rest of the work I do at home on the computer because I'm, I'm doing branding, packaging, all that kind of stuff. I'm working on new beers and that's, you know, we do that at home. We do that down uh, at the brewery. So it's sort of a mixed bag. And then I got other projects too. I've, I've got another, um, we're trying to finalize choose a publisher and finalize a contract on another book that's going to be kind of a science journalism book on tasting mm-hmm. you know really it's on the the, the chemical senses so smell mouthfeel uh, olfaction as told through the lens of the process of tasting beer and other things okay so, so uh, i heard your latest episode on beer smith podcast yeah and mm-hmm. um i have to give a shout out to that that podcast is great if you want to just hear a lot of really smart brilliant people talk about you know beer and and, and different aspects and he doesn't just cover beer mead inside all kinds of good stuff yeah yeah that's a great podcast just to learn yeah brad does a great job i'm mm-hmm. always always happy to be on there yeah somebody that does i've done up to four different podcasts at one time i do two shows now this one and then our live show on thursday liquid lunch and uh <laughs> That's a that's a, a podcast I'm a fan of. So and it's yeah, I think it's yeah. the only only other than the my own it's the only beer podcast I listen to. Yeah, because um, yeah. you know sometimes you just want to you know step back and listen to something else. So um, right, yeah. But that one's great. And you're and you were you've been on a, a number of times. And I have. Yeah. Your latest episode was about a month ago, I think. And mm-hmm. um, on YouTube and on you know anywhere you find anywhere finer podcasts are downloaded. But uh, you got into that conversation about your the your new book coming up. Um, yeah. Before I want to dig into that a bit, cause it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating, but, uh, the writing process, um, you, you know, you've put out a, a number of, of books and they're not just, you know, sh- small, short, you know, books to say it's a book. These are in depth, uh, just chock full of information. And, and it's, and it's not just, uh, encyclopedia. It, it, they're, they're entertaining to read. I mean, the way you mm-hmm. write is, is, is really, it's entertaining. Um, mm-hmm. How did, you know, how did all that come about as far? I know you mentioned the first book uh, from back in the early 90s, but, um, you know, take me through the, the book writing process a bit and, you know, how you approach it. Well, I, I was working at an, at, at uh, design studios and then I thought advertising might be a little more fun. And uh, so I kind of switched over 
to advertising seems like it might be similar, but they're they're actually quite a bit different in terms of the jobs. Mm-hmm. But in but uh, at the advertising agency I was at here in Chicago, uh, my boss was a really good writer, and there just came a need. I was working on new product development. Um, uh, projects for kind of supervising those for the for the agency, and I needed to be able to write um, concepts like to present to consumers. And so she beat the crap out of me for about a year and a half uh, on syntax and sent and sentence structure and flow and rhythm and and organization and all this kind of stuff. And so you know having a kind of a consumer facing marketing advertising background plus you know somebody who's really good at writing uh so you know i realized that it's imp- like we have to be brief you have to have a point you have to be well organized you have to make it really easy for people to read if you if you stumble over a sentence you know that's like that you have to go back and look at a sentence that's like death right so mm-hmm. that's part of the editorial process you know you you just like try and weed those out my wife's a good editor so she helps uh, work on that like copy editing for me and she's uh has the red pen of death she calls <laughs> and uh so you know it's it, but but really like for me i always want to do something new mm. And the, like, I never try and repeat myself in terms of a book. A lot of publishers would just have the a writer do the same book over and over. Like if this is a success, let's just refresh it and do a different one that's right. sort of the same idea. Michael Jackson's books were like that because that's what his publishers demanded he do. Uh, but for me, you know, it's always like spend about 10 years gathering info. Mm-hmm. Get it into an organized form, teach it a little bit, you know, give some presentations on it, and then uh, sit your butt down and write it. Uh, so basically, I try and do a really detailed uh, table of contents um, because this new book, I'm working with a lot of scientific journal papers. I'm actually cutting and pasting and pulling stuff out of these journals, plopping it into my giant outline, highlighting the parts I want to use in red. And, uh, you know, because the uh, publishers are going to want it footnoted, which is kind of a new thing for me. So I'm trying to make sure I'm really careful about where my information is sourced from mm. so that I've got that that paper trail of reference. It's not just something that pops into my head and finds its way onto a page that I've got that documentation behind it, even though it's a little messy. Um, but I can go back and look at that. Uh, so. And then uh, the other thing for me is that that's really always important. You know, you talked about different kinds of learning, and certainly what you can read is one thing, and, and we're language dependent. But uh, I find because I'm trained in the visual arts and visual communication specifically, I find that a lot of what I bring to my books is this ability to take information that's kind of hard to explain or the relationships between different parts of the information are not so obvious until you put it into a um, some kind of a spider diagram or a chart or a, a visualization of that that helps people see the whole landscape mm-hmm. of that concept, and then they can also see what the relationships are. And it often brings up some really interesting points that you wouldn't expect to find. This is how things are connected that you wouldn't have necessarily seen or... Yeah, well, here's a great example. I've, I did a, put together a chart on malt flavor. Mm-hmm. And, of course, malt flavor is driven largely by malt color, but it's not a linear relationship. Right. And what you find when you graph it out is you find that, you you know, you get malt that's like two degrees love bond is Pilsner and four degrees is pale ale and six or seven or eight is Munich. And then you get into melanoidins and you get all the way up to about 80, which is brown malt. And then there's a gap. They don't make malt from about 80 to about 200. And at 200, you, or 180 or 200, you start to come into the chocolate malts. And so that brings up the question, well, why don't they make malt in that 80 to 180 range? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, is that when you roast malt, you're building up more and more and more of these really annoying, obnoxious, uh, unpleasant flavor chemicals. And so they get more and more and more intense. And so in that range between 80 and 200 or so they're just the 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 beers will be unpalatable Hmm. but what happens is you if you keep roasting now you're starting to add enough heat that you're blowing off some of that stuff Hmm. you're volatilizing and expelling some of those harsh volatiles and maltsters actually use techniques where they'll spray that hot malt with water uh, which instantly turns into steam which creates a vacuum which sucks those chemicals out of the of the malt and so the longer you roast it the more color you develop but counterintuitively 
the cleaner and more delicate and smoother and softer the flavors are. Okay. So, and, and of course, Maltster's named chocolate malt for its color, but not for its flavor. Right. right. So this is a really essential thing, right? So now we have a, a data, like a, a whole understanding of the flavor of darker malts based on what the actual chemistry is, not based on what your eyes are telling you. Yes. Okay. What, uh, the, what, market, what the what the marketing people at the malt companies are have decided might be a good name for it. Yeah. Do mar- I think marketers take good stuff and just <laughs> do, do marketers ruin everything eventually? I don't. Uh... Well, you know, I am one. I try not to. It's 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 hard to, to communicate. And it, again, they don't have that insight. They're not brewing with it. Right. Right. They're just trying to sell it. Right. And it's like, oh, chocolate malt. Everybody loves chocolate. Boom. There we go. End of meeting. <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, you know, I work in, in TV all day long. I'm watching commercials and things like that. And yeah, you, you've got to have good marketing because you've got to get the information out there. And, yeah. and like you said, you have to do it in a way to where people are intrigued by it and want to hear it. You know, uh, the general public, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then, yeah. you know, at the same time, it's like they take a little bit of it a lot of times and then they just run, run, run and uh, run into the ground a lot of times. Right. So. Uh, well, like trip, triple hopped Miller Lite. Yeah. I could just see myself in the meeting, you know. Oh, man, you do it then? You do it this? Oh, wow, triple hop. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then everybody's like high-fiving each other because they came up with this great idea based on some under, some incorrect understanding of some reality that they glimpsed, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it's still in the package. Um, all right. Well, let's let's dig into the, the new book that you're currently in the process of, of – putting together and yeah. you got into this conversation it's about taste and 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 how that's all built and um i think this is one of the things that made me like i, I liked beer but at some point i fell in love with it and i think it's one mm-hmm. of those things i think this is the like for my personality and who i am just how multi-layered like everything builds on everything else as like with the flavors of the ingredients, you know, malt and the water chemistry and what hops and when you put them in and then the type of yeast and the, all the, all the variables that go into brewing. And then, you know, that's to me, that's, that's amazing. That builds so much, but then you take that after all of that, all that nuance and variation and everything, then you take the human, you bring in the human element of when we actually get to try it and smell it and see it. And, uh, you know, so uh, explain a bit, well, or a lot, however you, you just go with the flow, however, wherever the moment <laughs> leads you. Um, tasting a beer, you know, it's, um, it's a super complex process, but uh, d- drop some knowledge on us because it's, to me, I find it super fascinating. Um, yeah, well, it's a vast topic. Uh, and what's, what's fun is that there's been a huge amount of scientific research in the last 20 or 30 years that have started to untangle this stuff. Um, we process every one of our senses in a completely different way, right? So you would think that everything would be like our eyeballs. Like you look at something, you see it, you name it, you point out the color, you decide is it pretty or not, and and it goes somehow goes into memory. Hmm. Coming up with a word for something you see is super easy. Um, and and so we are because we're so visually driven we kind of make that assumption that that's how we do everything but it's really really not Mm -hmm. so that's the first thing that each sense is like its own completely different experience has its own set of rules it has its own set of ways it gets turned on and off a a way a way a different way that each one of them gets bored or filters out extraneous stuff Mm -hmm. you know and, and brings stuff to our attention um uh, that connects to hedonics, right? That sense of like or dislike uh, really differently. And so, um, again, we are uh, a lot of, and, and of course, there's a le- evolutionary evolutionary trail to all this, mm. right? Any creature that's alive has a sense of taste, mm. right? So, so almost by definition, if you don't have a sense of taste, you can't feed yourself and you can't run away from danger so that in bacteria 
they have a circuit directly connected to the motor that powers their little propeller, their flagellum, or wh whatever motive device they have. And when they smell something they like or taste it or whatever, the d definition sort of kind of all the same at that point, they swim towards what they like and they swim away from what they don't like, right? And we are very much like bacteria in that sense that we are uh, wired for direct action mm -hmm. on the chemo chemical senses and especially in our um, in our taste, that the first place the signals from our taste buds go, that is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami, they go to our brainstem. Mm. The brainstem, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways, right? The brainstem likes it or doesn't likes it. And for the most part, um, many of those are hardwired preferences. So sweet is a hardwired positive preference. Mm. Bitterness is a hardwired uh, negative preference or at least a high suspicion. Um, bitterness is actually prioritized over sweetness because the benefit of nutrition versus the danger of toxins, um, the toxins operate on a much shorter, much more urgent time scale, right? right? So, so it's like it, when you taste beer and food together, the if you have a sweet dish and a bitter dish, the bitter is going to kind of kill that sweetness because our bodies, our brainstem override like we'll over let bitterness override sweet because it's the more important message mm -hmm. given a conflict like you're going to say one thing let's talk about bitterness because it might be danger and it might be immediate whereas nutrition is something yeah we can skip a, skip a meal tomorrow we can get one tomorrow. we can skip a meal today we can get one tomorrow so mm -hmm. the time pressure is not urgent so so all this stuff is driving all these systems right and then you get up into olfaction it's a similar directness in terms of we are the very, very first thing our brains do with signals that come from our olfactory cortex and, and you know, from our noses is we decide do we like it or not like it, right? So you'll have a sense like, oh, this is nice or this is not nice. And it turns out that probably the, the wiring of our receptors that goes to this uh, – cortex that creates a pattern that our brain analyzes mm -hmm. to figure out what stuff is that things that we like are generally grouped together on that cortex so they're all those all the like esters are all kind of grouped together and those are generally pretty positive because esters are chemicals we find in fruits and they're lovely and they're pleasant and we like them and they're generally indicators that this might be food um, and although we apparently because uh, I'm still researching this, but for the most part, olfaction, the, the hedonics of olfaction is learned more than it is hardwired. Okay. So, right? so, so we develop a preference for sweet, or, well, for, for fruity aromas, let's say, or vanilla, mm -hmm. but we're not born with that, right? Mm -hmm. That that's learned behavior. People who live in societies where they have inadequate sanitation, mm -hmm. they're not driven mad by the smell of their own waste because this is what they're used to. And it's not, while, you know, we in civilized world would find that pretty hard to be around. Um, you know, we go camping and you kind of learn to ignore it anyway. But yeah. so a lot of this is like not, not hardwired like taste is. Yeah. That's, it's one thing that always, um, distracts me when I watch something like, uh, go back and watch a movie like Braveheart or something. And, uh, you know, Mel Gibson and, uh, the whichever lady at the time they start mugging down, I'm like, I know they didn't brush their teeth all that much. And I know it's been a while <laughs> since he's had a bath. If he's living back in, you know, back in medieval times, I, they can't smell good, but I guess they just ignored it. <laughs> well, they do. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a number of things, there's a number of things at work. And, and so this is another really interesting thing that I'm, that I'm researching is this, this phenomenon called habituation. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the phenomenon when you're painting a room and you're you don't notice the smell and you leave for a few minutes and then you come back and it's like, oh, my God, this room smells so terrible. I got to open the windows. Uh -huh. Right. And so you get habituated on a on a short term, on a really short term in beer tasting. It's a problem because there's certain chemicals, um, you know, your your olfactory receptors only fire signals into your brain when there's a change of state. Hmm. So going from smelling the room air to smelling a part, some flavors in a beer, like that's a change. Mm -hmm. But the, if you keep sniffing and sniffing and sniffing, you're going to stop firing because, yeah, we've got this information already. We're not going to repeat it for you. Mm -hmm. 
right? So it, it, it's a problem in tasting, and sometimes you actually need to reset yourself to smell the back of your hand, or sometimes in competitions, I've seen uh, espresso beans on the table. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you go to the, the uh, beans, yeah. You can smell the, the coffee, and then now you you reset. Yeah, they'll but do, it that, also, do that in the perfume it, section of the, uh, you go to the, the store, and they have the, all the perfumes, they'll have the little oh, yeah. coffee beans there, and you can... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so and that's a problem for people that make perfume uh, because people habituate to it. Um, I, I, I heard a story about Mountain Dew and I don't know whether it's true anymore, but apparently it was at least w was true. It may still be true that they know exactly what the perfect formula for Mountain Dew is, mm -hmm. but they never make it. So they make. They look at this, what the center of Mountain Dew is, and then they rotate around that center. So w one quarter of the year, it's a little more citrusy. Hmm. One quarter of the year, it's a little more sweet. One quarter of the year, it's a little more acidic, right? And maybe there's something else in the fourth quarter. So they rotate that around. So when you pick up a bottle of Mountain Dew, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, I don't remember being quite this fizzy or sweet or, or citrusy or it just feels extra fresh to me now mm -hmm. as opposed to being the same old dull old thing. And so, you know, there is so much – uh, manipulation going on at that consumer level so people that make doritos and people that make air fresheners and you know everybody who makes products that are involved with the chem chemical senses mm -hmm. they have to find ways to keep us engaged and keep us coming back you know doritos splashes extra um seasoning on like one out of every dozen chips or so huh. uh, because you find it and you think, aha, I beat the man, you know, so you get a little dopamine hit. Yeah. And then also like you're energized because like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll find another one. Uh, now I'm like, that's reminding me how much I like this flavor. And you're going to dig all the way down to the bottom of the bag. Right. Yeah, so, I was going to say they they trick you by hiding all the best chips at the bottom. So you <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. I mean, it's like it's it's very carefully designed uh, because we are highly manipulable and and in order to. Um, buy the products and enjoy them the way that we want to enjoy them, we sometimes have to be tricked into doing that. So, I mean, it's a whole kind of like morally you could question, is that a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, but at the very least, it's really fascinating. Yes. And now you've got me questioning myself because last night I was having this conversation about, you know, it, it came up, you know, I, there was a, it was a thing I, I'd posted online and then somebody just put the, the first post, somebody commented terrible beer. And I was like, then I went into this whole diatribe about how, you know, if something, you know, you'd have to define what is terrible beer. And then somebody said, oh, you mean like Bud Light? And I'm like, well, it depends on what your criteria is. As far as consistency, it's a marvel of consistency. You know, they, the beer that they brew in Houston versus St. Louis versus California, it's, you couldn't tell the difference. But now you got It's me. an excellent beer. It's just maybe you, know, you like it or not. And it's, you know, right. it, maybe it's boring. It's sin is it's boringness but that's how people use it too yes it, it needs to be boring for people to consume it the way they consume it yes but now you got me thinking do they ever do you know of any macro brewers that uh you know do they manipulate similar to the the mountain dew approach you know i've never heard anything along those lines i i would be surprised if they did mm. um you, you know and it probably i'm not sure it would make all that much difference because Mo generally consumers have a hard time picking out their brand versus uh, one of the other breweries brands yeah there are differences you know Coors is kind of famous for having a bit of a banana note to it um, you know you can look and see a Miller product because they use a, uh, a hop that has had the precursor to the light struck skunky thing removed and that's a foam positive thing so mm -hmm. a Miller Lite or Miller in Genuine Draft will have this beautiful head on it you can just tell the difference from looking at a, a Bud Budweiser, uh, and then Budweiser is famous for having a bit of a green apple-y kind of note. Yeah, uh, supposed to be mostly a, a sort of an estery compound. You know, the lagers, those those mass market lagers are not really quite lagers. Mm -hmm. They're they're not really they're they're fermented a little warm and they're aged a little short uh, for to be really a, what you'd say like a true or classic kind of lager. But you know, they, they're built to do a certain thing for people, and um, you know, they do their job really well. They do, they do. And, you know, that's a fun, you, you mentioned that people have a hard time picking between the, the three, you know, um, I was actually watching, I saw that beer wars is almost, I don't know if, if you remember that documentary. Yep. Uh, it's 10 years in April since that, mm -hmm. that documentary came out, which, you know, yeah. there's been a world of change in the craft beer, you know, scene. And, uh, oh God, yeah. that was one of the things that they did on that, 
documentary was have the blind tasting uh, and people couldn't do it. And so it kind of made me want to, I want to, like, it's been forever since I've had one of those beers. Uh, but, yeah. it, I, you know, I kind of want to challenge myself and you see. You should do a blind taste on it. Yeah, I, we have a guy here in the in the Chicago Beer Society who's a scholar of cheap beer. <laughs> and, and he used to be able to pick out which factory the Pabst was made out of. Really? Yeah. That's, uh... He, you know, he, he was one of the rare beer geeks that actually really enjoyed just mass market beer in the right time and place and does, but he knew, he really knew it well uh-huh. and had a really good palate for it. Um, okay. Well, back to the, uh, the, the sensory and the, and the different, um, you know, a learned behavior or learned, uh, appreciation, I guess, for flavors. Um, you know, I've told people that just get into craft beer, they, you know, they try an IPA, uh, and you know, the bitterness is typically a turnoff. Uh, sure. for most people, now, my wife was a different story. She tried it and instantly she's like, Ooh, that's, you know, she's a, a hop heads hop head. Uh, but the, um, was the phenomenon known as a lupulin threshold shift? Is that, um, <laughs> is that like, a <clears throat> is that part of that? Just, uh, like building the muscle of, of, of flavor, uh, appreciation. Is it like a learned thing where you realize that that, that type of bitterness is not a threat or how does that? What have you learned? Well, I, 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 get, I, I wish I knew. Um, we have 26, I think it is, different taste receptors for bitterness. Mm-hmm. We have multiple copies of some of those, and some of those receptors come in uh, strong and weak flavors, right? Okay. And so we're all built a little differently. Um, you may have heard a term called super tasters, mm-hmm. which is very, really kind of, overly narrow in, in what it is talking about that is specifically referring <clears throat> excuse me specifically referring to people who have a high sensitivity to the types of bitterness that are found in broccoli mm. and brussels sprouts and other kinds of green vegetables and um but we, it turns out we are really different in all of our sensitivities so um you know, each one of us sort of experiences the world in a bit of a different way. And it's clear that you can learn to overcome your um, hardwired biases. Now, unlearning to like sweet, that may be a little more difficult, yeah. you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know that the that the warning of bitterness is always like a hard and fast I'm going to spit it out. It's horrible. Mm. But it certainly has been this evolutionary dance that animals and plants have done to try and eat each other or not eat each other and and uh you know over the over the uh, countless aeons um so uh, pretty pretty fascinating but yeah i don't know that's something to to look and see if there's any literature out there about habituation to bitterness and just like becoming more comfortable i'm, I'm not i'm not sure who would be studying it but it's amazing what people study so that's something yeah. else to throw on the file um uh have you done i i've i've not look this up but have you done um audio versions of any of your books um i I know you have the the e-versions of them and they uh i like the paper versions but the e-versions are great when you're out and you're wanting to just reference and it's on your phone or whatever but uh oh yeah yeah absolutely uh we do have a uh, um a a version audio version of tasting beer okay did you did you happen to read that one i Uh, didn't they never even asked me uh, they got some guy i don't know (laughs) I'm just <laughs> just sitting here talking and, and having listened to you on other podcasts. I don't know if you've ever considered doing your own podcast. It's just, a- uh, you know, I, um, I don't really do much in the way of social media. Mm-hmm. I've got a, I'm a content generator, Yeah, but I don't have the bandwidth to be a content generator and be a self promoter and organize podcasts and spend my time doing that. Yeah. I got two degrees, always a book in the queue or trying to promote one and some, freelance design work and a bunch of other stuff I'm trying to do. So it's like, I'm actually looking at, um, maybe getting a, getting an intern or getting a, somebody to help me part-time with some social media stuff. So, I mean, a podcast would be interesting. I always have lots of stuff to, that I want to talk about. And I know a lot of people that have things to say, but, uh, I, we're, we're a long way from away from that at this yeah. point. All right. Well, I just, I wanted to make sure I mentioned it before we, you know, ended our conversation that, Sure. You know, some people, some people have the gift of gab and, and, and they're interesting to listen to. And you, you, you've hit all those, uh, all of those, I mean, you, you know, information and then a, a pleasant way of presenting it. And obviously that it comes through on your books, but, uh, 
you know, I don't know. I, I personally, and I'm, well, thanks. I'm, I'm obviously, obviously biased. I love the audio <laughs> side of stuff. I think you can't shut yeah. me most of the time. Um, okay. So bitterness, we've, we've talked a bit about, um, my wife, huge hop head, but mm-hmm. can't, cannot stand sour beers. I, for one, love, love sour beers. Um, I like it when they make the, the sides of your, your jowls suck in a bit and you know, that, that tart, you know, just gets you right there. I, I, I love that. It is, um, sour or, or tartness. Is that similar to the, the bitter side of things or, uh, what do we know? Yeah, I think tart, I th- from what I understand about it, uh, tart acidity is a po- is a sort of a, a warning. It's not an all out alarm bell, but it's definitely a, like, you should question this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in nature, it's mostly related to the ripeness of fruit. Right. So consuming large amounts of green fruit for human beings is probably not a great idea. Um, and so I think we're kind of born to, to question that. Uh, again, there are different sensitivities for all of the tastes and, and all of the aromas in our genome. Uh, I'm one of those people I always like to say about sour beer that I love everything about them except the actual sitting down and drinking them. <laughs> Right. I love talking about them. I love the mystery of them. I love the aromas. Uh, if they're good, uh, I, I, I like, you know, I, 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 the, the, the little ecosystems that you generate in a lambic or something are fascinating. People do it all kinds of different ways. Uh, but I don't like a huge amount of acidity. So I do like I do like the ones like the, the sour farmhouse ones. I really enjoy if they're not too crazy sour. Uh, now, my wife can eat a lemon. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. You know. I just I just don't want that much acidity. It just to me it's just unpleasant uh, if it's really strongly acid. You know I'll take I'm about halfway through the lambic spectrum. You know like a Frank Bone, super easy. You know but you get into some of those ones like Hansons and stuff and it's just a little too much for me. But I do like smelling them and I'll I'll, I'll taste them. I'll I'll take a small glass. Um, you know in the right situation. So, um, but uh, I will say that having been trained and focused on a lot of quality issues and being a pretty sensitive taster to some of the less pleasant things that you can find in sour beer. Mm -hmm. I will say that uh, there's a lot of beer out there on the market that really is pretty hard to love. Yeah. Uh, So I find there's a lot of beers out there that are wood, wood aged beers that have not bourbon barrel, but like wood sour wood beers that have a huge amount of acetaldehyde mm. because they've let the oxygen um, sort of uh, take over the barrel, and you've got a lar- you get a large amount of acetobacter producing both acetic acid, but it also makes a fair amount of acetaldehyde, mm. and that is that sort of depending upon how you perceive it it can taste like green apples or pumpkin guts or avocado or latex paint or uh the dirty underside of a lawnmower uh which is how i first like started to understand it myself so Uh and and, uh, in large amounts it presents itself as a a strong nail polish solventy kind of thing much like uh, uh some esters do so i find myself with a lot of sours smelling them and thinking oh no i can't even put this in my mouth and and then also a lot of kettle soured beers, they if you if you're not careful, they will produce a, a sulfur compound or a couple of sulfur compounds called mercaptans. And those particular mercaptans can either smell like a garbage truck or an old outhouse. But neither one of those are really great. And I've seen it <laughs> we struggle with that in, in one of my breweries that we've been doing kettle sours, kinda you know, by the book and and most everybody else is like fine. I, I like them funky, you know, whatever. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. These are not right. Me and the me and the head brewer are like, now nah, we're we're just going to give up on this until we can really figure out how to do it. And the people that are doing them well are doing them in. Uh, they've got their own fermenter specifically for lactic fermentations, and they're keeping the oxygen out, and they're not doing like a just a regular kettle sour. They're actually making work. They're putting it in the fermenter. They're fermenting that sour beer, and they're blending it back in, and I think that's the process you need to use, and for a brew pub situation like, like we're at, it's really not, uh, we're, we're not there. So we've been uh, experimenting with different things. We're working with uh, sour um, acidified malt, and, and uh, you know, there's other ways to get that lactic uh, acidity into a beer. So uh, I'm kind of, that's another one for me, but I'm 
again, I've been trained on those chemicals. I'm pretty sensitive to them, and I find them really objectionable. But the market ne- doesn't necessarily. Okay. Um, well, going from uh, bugs that help make beer to bugs that help us taste beer, uh, our, our gut biome. Uh, I've heard a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk about it. I, you know, when you just look at like, uh, nutrition and, and wellness and that sort of thing in that, those areas of conversation, um, being key to, um, you know, is your gut biome healthy or you, you know, or how are you probiotics and all that sort of thing, but they have a big, uh, big impact on how we taste beer. Correct. I don't know that that's true. Oh. If it is true, mm-hmm. um, then I want to know about it. Okay. What I what I have been able to find out a couple of like one incredibly frightening thing. Of course, we have taste buds all through our body, mm-hmm. right? Our insulin uh, blood level in, of of insulin is regulated by taste cells. Really. This is one reason why diet soda mm-hmm. creates the same type of um, insulin type reactions as sugar does, mm. because it's it's just the whole process is regulated by chemosense rather than some other type of sensing. Okay. And um, so the frightening thing is that there is some evidence now that you're, that the microbes in your gut are, oh, and the other thing is, is that our taste buds, we can, we can perceive them in our brain because they can, they can send signals to our brains, Mm -hmm. but they also can in, in these applications where they're in your gut and they're in your bones and they're in your pancreas, they are wired into our hormonal system, Mm. bypassing the brain entirely or bypassing at least any kind of area that might lead to a conscious awareness. So they're processed in a way that, uh, affects our, that's driven by our hormonal system, in particular two hormones called leptin and ghrelin that are involved in satiation Mm -hmm. and hunger. Mm -hmm. And so there's some evidence that bacteria are capable of creating chemicals that can signal our hormonal system and essentially ask or demand that we eat food to bring them more sugar to eat. Mm. And there's some evidence that the bacteria in our mouth may also possibly be able to do that although i haven't seen the paper on that uh but somebody told me that that that's kind of an emerging thing so hmm. in in a way we're kind of like our, not only is is this microbiome this fantastically complex sort of organ almost of these communicating bacteria in several hundred species that if, that is affected by what we eat not it also affects how we behave and what we eat because it's requesting certain things from us. Uh, and that's like really alien stuff. Yeah. Oh, that is just as weird as anything in any science fiction book I've ever read. So, you know, and that's the great wonder of all this is just like how all this stuff is connected and how we're built. It's just amazing. Um, I wonder how long it'll be until that holds up in in court to say, uh, it wasn't my fault. My, uh, my bacteria made me do it. Uh, I had to steal this uh, host <laughs> snowball, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other thing, another one other little tidbit about bacteria in your mouth is that um, there's a, a type of tasting called a retronasal tasting, mm-hmm. which is basically you're smelling through your nose, but not through the front of your nose. You're smelling the, the vapors that are coming up the back of your throat and up into your nose that direction. Mm-hmm. Your brain has airflow sensors. It knows which way the wind's blowing in there mm-hmm. and it switches into somewhat different mode. But one of the things that happens is that there are chemicals in things like beer that are called um, glycosides. And what a glycoside is, is an aromatic molecule that are generally very small and highly volatile that is connected to a sugar molecule, which are much larger and much, much less volatile. And as long as that aromatic molecule remains bound to that sugar molecule, it's going to just stay there. And you can't smell it. You can't taste it. It is not going anywhere. You can go through the whole whole brewing, boiling, fermentation process. Those hop oils are still stuck onto those, onto those sugar molecules. But when it hits your mouth, there are enzymes in your saliva and also enzymes in the several hundred species of bacteria that are in your mouth that break those glycosidic bonds. And now it's releasing aroma that no matter how hard you smell, you're never going to smell in the glass because it's not smellable. Yeah. Right? But- and, and tooth brushing will kill those bacteria. So, yeah. like, never brush your teeth 
you know, right before an important tasting because it's going to kind of um, not not only does that mint get in the way, but but uh, there's chemicals in they put in toothpaste that kill bacteria. You know, because huh. they're trying to fight back bad breath. There's all this weird chemical. Like, I just saw a presentation about um, oral hygiene products at a flavor conference, and it was fascinating. As there's just all kinds of stuff going on in there, in those products. It's really yeah. interesting. Well, I wonder if it's like, um, you know, the response to like an, like antibiotics. They just take out everything, as opposed to you know we have good and bad, you know, uh, stuff going on inside of it. Right? We need some of the the bacteria and all that kind of thing, and that's kind of the drawback to antibiotics they just kind of wipe out everything yeah now in your mouth it's going to knock them down for an hour and then they grow right back it's okay. not going to you know it's not going to sterilize your mouth or even sanitize it. it's just going to knock the load down and you feel like oh i got fresh breath now and then like an hour later it's right back to where it was so okay okay um now it's fascinating that the fact that until like you you kind of have it, it has to hit the kind of the back of your your throat right for the for that to come up the back of your nose and that sort of thing or is it just a yeah yeah and uh, yeah and it's basically what you you know and there's a specific technique for it so you know you for for a tasting once you've got that liquid in your mouth you want to let it warm up a little bit mm -hmm. uh the wine people do what they call chewing the wine mm -hmm. so they kind of you know move their lips and and like swish swirl it around like mouthwash almost you know <laughs> and and you're trying to coat all that inside surface of your mouth between your teeth and your lips and your palate and everything, you're trying to spread that beer out. And that makes it available to the taste buds that are not only on your tongue, but are elsewhere in your mouth. And the chemical and the uh, sensor, the, the touch sensors that can sense astringency, creaminess, all those sorts of things. But you're also warming it up and, and volatilizing a huge amount of aromatic molecules. And then you swallow it, um, and after you swallow, you breathe out with your lips closed, and that'll that'll drive that um, those vapors um, up through your nose the other way. And when your brain is in um, that retronasal condition, it's looking at it somewhat different. First, it it creates this thing called flavor that combines taste, mouthfeel, what your eyes see, and aroma. And puts it all together and makes flavor for you, mm -hmm. right? And also, you get – it's a little bit more focused on familiarity and preference and dislike than what comes in the front of your nose. I mean, both – do both of that, but, but like, it a, seems a little bit more um, wired for that in that retronasal. And again, there's airflow sensors that know which way it's coming, so it switches from one mode to another depending if you're breathing in or breathing out. Uh, does the level of CO2 in a particular beer, how much impact does that have on, on that? Like when you do the, the chewing as, you know, for the, is that, or is that, well, you're kind of knocking that out, you know, mm -hmm. once you get it in your mouth and it starts to warm up and it gets into a, like a thin film, that CO2 is pretty gone pretty quickly. Okay. You know, CO2 is really helpful in a beer for, uh, first of all, it's fun. Mm. <clears throat> Second of all, when you're eating food with it, it scrubs stuff off your palate. So it's got that benefit, but from a flavor standpoint the benefit of co2 is that it creates bubbles bubbles of bubbles are full of aroma every time a bubble pops you got a little squirt of aroma up in the air so like professional brewers actually have to train themselves to taste beer in the tank uncarbonated or carbonated at a low level mm -hmm. um, after fermentation and decide how much hop aroma, for example, or whatever kind of aroma is in that beer, knowing that it's going to jump up a little bit when you finally uh, put that beer up to full carbonation, and that's going to bring a lot more aroma up into your nose. And so, you know, we're always tasting beer, and you want to taste it in the tank, you know, decide, oh, we're going to do that third dry hop, or should we do this, add this other flavoring ingredient if we're making a chocolate cake beer or whatever it happens to be and so you're trying to make that decision and that's something that professionals have to learn that consumers never have to worry about but it really changes the the flavor of it up and it also shifts the balance around because carbonation is a little bit acidic also mm. Mm. okay um now i i heard you mention on on beersmith i wanted to delve into this a little bit the part i think i found most fascinating in that conversation is when you started talking about uh, when you were doing a tasting and they had the loud music playing and uh, it, it um, 
the the loudness of the music because that perception like you're you were hearing and that kind of i guess took the focus of your your senses away to where you couldn't taste the beer quite as well um and i, I hope i'm saying oh, or at all in at our all. case so we so we were tasting along with the cicerone master candidates and part of that examination is that they get uh, twice a day, several panels of off flavors that have to be described or categorized or something. Mm -hmm. And we, as the judges, the examiners, we always taste along in those panels as kind of a check. Like if nobody gets it, we're not going to penalize students for not getting it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, we, uh, we, you know, we were at a brew pub in the afternoon and they had the music rock and roll music going as brew pubs do and we got all these panels in front of us and we just sort of stared at them until somebody looked up and said anybody else not getting anything uh -huh. and it's like yeah i got nothing and everybody's like uh and then one of us thought i wonder if it's the no the noise mm -hmm. and so we had him turn down the music and it was like flipping a switch it was startling and so apparently looking into this um that the brain uses similar type of neural processing mm -hmm. for language as it does for the pattern recognition on aroma, believe it or not. Okay. Or if not for language, but for auditory processes. And so they're either trying to use the same part of the brain or they're trying to use brain resources in some other way, mm -hmm. and there's a conflict, and uh, sound gets the priority because again, if some if there's some big cat sneaking up on you from behind, right. the flavor can wait. Yes, so I wonder <clears throat> if there's a ratio of sound to to flavor. If you know, is the, is like what decibel level, and, and even if maybe even type of music and the rhythm and that sort of thing would have like an optimum effect, like as far as like level of enjoyment of a certain beer. Uh, like, should there be certain music type and sound pairings with beer to optimize? Well, well, now you're into art, <laughs> right? That ain't science. Well, maybe. I don't know. If, if, I don't if, know. You know, I mean, I haven't seen the paper, so I don't know. You know, right now, the research I'm doing, I'm really focusing pretty strongly about trying to trying to bring my experience and the things that I've seen and experienced. I'm trying to dig into every little one of those things piece mm -hmm. by piece and try and find the papers and uh, see what science is doing as far as like sorting all this stuff out so you know that's an interesting thing i mean certainly the music you play at your brew pub or tap room is important it it uh, brings people together or it drives people away or you know and and you know there's certain crowds that really like a, a lot a high level of noise certain crowds really don't mm -hmm. and um you know every, every you know I, but again i think you know i don't know when the psychological crosses over just into the realm of like we just do it because we like it and we're never going to really explain this and uh it, certainly there is a point where it does become um problematic and i i think i i don't know whether i told the story on brad's show or not but the the airlines are well aware that wine tastes crappy in the air you know right. airline food tastes terrible and you know, the food's not great up there, but part of the problem is that the noise is really uh, interferes with uh, the smelling process. Yeah. And so no matter how good the food is, it's always going to taste much worse or the wine. It's always going to taste much worse at, at altitude, but it's not the actual altitude because they've tested for that. It's the noise of those jet engines. So if you want to enjoy your beer wine on the plane more, get some of the like a noise noise canceling headset or something or blah i've got some in canal in canal um like um you know earphones and those are great it changed my life on airplanes just because it it knocks that it knocks that level down to a point where it's um background uh -huh. instead of foreground so uh made a big difference for me yeah maybe that's why like when the, i have i have three daughters and when the noise level gets to a certain <laughs> a certain point you know it's like i can't it's like i need y'all to i need y'all to not do what not do what y'all are doing the screaming and the i'm glad you're having fun but I, I just i can't like my brain won't concentrate on anything else yeah no exactly right and it you know the, there's that sort of famous thing that we that we only use 10 percent of our brains mm -hmm. and and it, the science is proving that to be absolutely not the case we use all of our brains mm -hmm. we're only aware of 10 percent yeah 
right? So, so we only think, you know, like what we know we're doing, that's about 10%. Mm-hmm. And there's all this stuff in the background. And, and you know, there's limited resources, even in a, even an almost infinite organ. Uh, you're trying to do very, when you're like processing auditory cues, there are these subtle phase cues with like microsecond timing and like a lot of really complicated um Data, basically data processing going on. And it's true for face recognition. It's true for uh, olfaction and trying to understand aromas. And mm-hmm. you, you think about a beer, you put a beer to your lips, you, you're drinking, you're smelling 2,000 chemicals or more mm-hmm. in a beer. It's one of the more complicated things there is to yeah. smell. And like, how does your brain, how do you pull all that apart, make sense of it, go back to your life experiences, categorize stuff, put it in, like still manage to perceive it as a whole, but peel the layers back. I mean, it's really fantastically um, complex. It's just a wonder of um, of uh, adaptive engineering. You know, it really is pretty cool. Yeah, and and that's again, that's I think that's what makes me love beer so much is that we've only we've learned a whole bunch a whole bunch over the last well the last few years, but I mean the history of beer, you know, thousands of years that you know what we've what it's taken to get to this point, and we've only scratched the surface. Like we've just, sure. there's so much, there's so much we don't know. It's like, well, good. Let's keep drinking it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it, you know, it, it, I, I've always said that it, the beer and brewing, brewing in particular, home brewing or commercial brewing, whatever it is, it tends to attract people who want to use both halves of their brain. Hmm. Right. So it draws a lot of artists mm-hmm. in who, like me, who want to play mad scientists and really want to understand science better and want to have have a hand in something that has a highly technical aspect to it yeah. but it also brings in a lot of software people and engineers who yeah. who who love the technical and they're very competent in it but they want the opportunity to be self-expressive and to to play in this other area of of psychology and art and and uh, like trying to create something that will have a transformative effect on the people that drink it you know so i think it really that's one of the reasons for me that the beer that um almost to a person people that i met in the beer world uh are just the most interesting people and and um think deeply about what they do and uh always a lot of fun to be around so yeah i that's one thing i've yes i've absolutely noticed that doing all these interviews for this podcast is that yes it's typically people start either on the technical engineering side or the artistic side they have, it's one or the other they have that starting point and then they kind of converge in the middle at, yeah. at some point um, but speaking of, yep. uh, of innovation, I wanted to get, um, I wanted to get your expert opinion on, on some of the, I don't know if I'd call it silliness, but maybe it's just, um, I don't know, an attempt to, to try new things, uh, like say like glitter beer. Um, <laughs> it, to me, it just, I mean, it's, it's fun in a moment, I suppose when I see it, I'm like, okay, that's an interest, but, um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on say on like specific, like, like glitter beer? What is there? I guess. jumped the shark. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, a, you know, I understand I'm, I'm in Chicago. We were announced a couple of weeks ago as having more breweries than any other city in the country, yeah. which probably means we have more breweries than any other city on the planet. Uh-huh. And, uh, we have 156 breweries in the Chicago Metro area wow. now. And, uh, so what that means for drinkers is just like paradise beyond imagining right because yeah. you've got all these beers they're everywhere as a brewer it's ferocious competition yes and just to get people's attention to stay on people's radar uh you know and 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 because we are highly driven by a very small group of very intense enthusiasts on the internet that pushes breweries to do certain kinds of things. Yeah. This whole pastry stouts thing mm. is really driven by this hardcore group, you know, that's on untapped and all the, those forums. And they are demanding this sort of retro nostalgic 7-Eleven based beers that have a lot of lactose and have a lot like super intense super sweet super undrinkable but you know <laughs> yeah. they i mean and we see them at, at, at our brew pub people come in they get our whatever our buzz beer is they get a five ounce of it they take a picture they check it in on untap they give it a rating then they order a new england ipa or two and then they start drinking lager uh-huh. so it's like you know if you guys want us to make that for you it would be really nice if you would actually drink it 
Yes. Because do them, you know, because we want to be part of the conversation. We want to do them. They're fun to do. Uh Uh, But it's like, are are these beers really for drinking or is this some kind of parlor game that we're all engaged in here? You know, is this really is this really what beer is all about? It's sort of one of those like questions you can only answer over a beer or discuss over a beer. But but it. You know, and I think glitter beer is just like a cry for help. <laughs> uh, something that some goofy person did it at a, at a bar or did it at a party at somebody's birthday party. And it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then like now everybody's got to make a glitter beer. But uh, it's like, OK, done, check, finished. Like I don't like I like more pr- profound things. Yes. You know, I like. To dig up history i'm actually working with i'm i'm recreating historical vermouths right now mm. because i'm trying to wrap my head around the the mindset of people back in the 19th century when they were doing all these liqueurs and bitters and and vermouths and working with wormwood and and orris root and rhubarb root and all these crazy uh, uh, herbs that are sort of now they're not really lost but they're not what we would consider culinary or or really part of the mainstream of, of beer or anything outside of the liquor and Amaro kind of world. So, you know, I like to do stuff that has some profound depth to it. You know, it's like what I shoot for. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with just clean fun too, but, but I, I, you know, like how hard is it to make a beer and throw Twinkies in it, (laughs) you know, or Kool-Aid or Tang or it's like, okay, great. That's fine. You know, as an internet meme, that's great. Uh But, I mean, I don't know. Again, it's sort of like shark jumping, and yeah. that's that. I, I don't want to be like the serious guy that says everything has to be serious, but it, it's a, a been a little silly in the last couple of years, I will say. Yeah, I, I don't know if don't we're know. past it. Um, I, I feel like it's waning, though. I guess the maybe, or maybe I'm just tired of it. <laughs> well, I, you know, Tom Tom Wolf, the the writer Tom Wolf, wrote a, a big article for Harper City so turned into a book. And I think it was title was something like the end of art. And it was basically making the point that when an artist finally reduces a painting to the point where it's a blank white canvas, uh-huh. like that thread is dead. Uh-huh. Right. There's no you can't go any further than that. You've got to back your way out of the alley, yeah. make a right turn and go find something else to do for a while. Yeah. You know, because you can get more and more and more minimalist. And I think it's sort of the same. Once you've got glitter beer, <laughs> like what, like what's next? Ball bearings or <laughs> you know, it's sort of like it gets to be like, OK, great. That's fine. But I think we have to back out and we have to kind of go and figure out like what the what the next thing's going to be because you, you can't you can't take that forever and honestly who wants to really drink a six pack of that uh no i i like yeah i'm like uh, you know I'll, I'll try the one or two sips but then yeah after that i'm not um yeah i would yeah give me the give me the crisp lager give me the you know give me, i don't know uh i don't know I, not well, not novelty beer. I mean, right. that's what it is, is a novelty. And it's sort of like, ha ha, we get the joke. OK, great. Fine. Next. Yeah. Do you think that uh, breweries make a make a mistake when they go in that direction too much? Do you- I don't know. I can't speak for other breweries. I'm again, you know, it's hard to be successful now. Yeah. It's hard to break out. It's hard to find your audience. I think, um, you know. I, you want to do that just fine with fine with me but again it's like it's not a trend it's a sort of a dead end uh-huh. you know it's this extreme nostalgia and what's it what's kind of funny for me that a lot of the nostalgia of the millennials who are very nostalgic uh-huh. are seem to be nostalgic for my childhood not their own yeah you know it's like the scooby-doo era uh-huh. and the the like all that and it's just kind of interesting how nostalgia works and it's sort of like a nostalgia for an era that they never lived through yeah but maybe wish they had and i think that drives a lot of those you know that sort of uh the pastry beers and the pop pop tart beer and tang beer and Uh because i I remember when tang came out Uh and we thought it was stupid then you know (laughs) (laughs) and it didn't taste very good but now it's like oh it's just got this retro ironic sort of retro cool you know, from this mid '60s era, the the mid century uh-huh. that the people are really fascinated with, and so it's like I understand it, but it's a it's still a little it's it's just funny how people pick up on a historical epoch and sort of make it their own. Yeah, uh, 
for whatever reasons. I, sociologically, it's really fascinating. Yeah, I think like I, with my kid, I, maybe it's one of those things where the access to all the like the cartoons and stuff, like uh, when you talk Scooby Doo, I mean that's all available all the time. You yeah, know, it used to be you wait for Saturday morning to come around, and mm-hmm. that was like your two hours in that morning. And then once you saw pro wrestling come on, you're like, okay, cartoons are done. But, yeah, you know, but it's like now they have it all the time. Like my kids don't even know what it means to wait for like for a show to come on. You right, know, there's a Cartoon Network, and now they're streaming. So. Yes, yeah, the Cartoon Network. That's I think that's who we're seeing come online now in the beer era. Within the, when the streaming generation comes along, I don't know what we're gonna do. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't know. Well, I, I will say there's never been a time when the drinkers have been more in charge of the beer. Mm-hmm. Right. So it used to be homebrewers drove innovation. Yeah. I mean, and that was pretty much the first let's, you know, with the exception of anchor steam and some of the really early ones, um, you know, really the, the, the modern IPA thing was driven l- largely by homebrewers. A lot of like the American brown ale mm-hmm. style, the red ales, like a lot of beers were really homebrewers, homebrews first and people, eventually moved on from homebrewing to start up breweries. Um, you know, so homebrewers really were quite ahead of the curve pretty much until the New England IPAs, I think. Mm. That was, for, for me, the first big trend in beer that the homebrewers were not driving the bus. Mm. And that, of course, was, you know, some of those guys out there in, in um, New Hampshire and Vermont and wherever, Massachusetts, um, that it became a thing. You know, again, thanks to the Internet, yeah. thanks for that, like being able to instantly form relationships, tell people when the beer's ready and they can drive and get it and all that kind of stuff that wouldn't really have been able to happen through a normal type, type of distribution system. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's also pretty fascinating. So, yes. you know, consumers like beer drinkers, they can't complain that they don't have what they want because they're driving the bus in a lot of ways, you mm-hmm. know. Um so you mentioned uh, New England IPAs. Um, yep. when, when I look at it, I, you know, there are some that I enjoy. There are mm-hmm. some that I've, I can't quite bring myself to, to enjoy. Like there, there's something about like whenever it's scratch, like it feels like somebody punched me in the throat or, uh, you know, it's, scratch, it's a throat scratchy element to some of those. Uh, oh, yeah. We, we call that hot burn. Yes. Hot, I'm right. Not, so I, that's. That's a, you know, that's a, a, appears to be, and I don't know the science on this, but that appears to be a phenomenon of these extremely young beers that, uh, where you have very high dry hop rates and it creates that like, pe- almost like a black pepper, uh-huh. uh, burn, slightly burn sensation in your, in your throat. Yeah. And, uh, we, as brewers, we're not crazy about that, but we know that the market likes them super ultra fresh and that the, that the people that come and buy our beers, they like that. Hmm. And so we prefer the beers after about two weeks uh-huh. because that, that goes away. Yeah. And, th- and there's sort of a, a fiction that these beers are really only good for a couple of weeks. And that's just absolutely not true. We think they we think they improve a little bit, and you know we've got can libraries where we're checking the beers every month or so, and I've got beers from six months th- that actually still taste really nice and still have a huge amount of hop aroma, and uh, you know so for us like that first couple of weeks we could skip, uh-huh. but again the the people that like those they want it right out of the tank, throw it in the can, call them up and let them know it's ready, <laughs> um, and you know and I I think the other thing that uh, there are some out on the market that are yeasty, mm. and yeast should have nothing to do with that. You know, yeast is dead stuff living in dead stuff in your beer, and dead stuff doesn't really taste that good. So, um, you know, we we tasted some bad ones, we tasted some good ones, and uh, because we we had a sales manager that I was out east, and he was bringing stuff back pretty regularly, and and you know, after we tasted a few of the good ones, it's like, oh, okay, now I see what we can, you know, this might be something we can work with. Mm. For me. I love wheat beer. Mm. You know, if I was ever going to open Randy Moser Brewing, we would make wheat. Like we would have, everything would have wheat in it because yeah. I like the creaminess. I like that. I like wheat. I like wheat beer. I like Hefeweizen. I like wheat in my IPAs because these are basically wheat beers. Uh, they're wheat IPAs, mm. basically mm. wheat or rye or oats or all of that. Yeah. Right. So the ones that we make, we do about 50 percent unmalted adjunct. Mm. 
right? That's we find that's really necessary to get that creamy texture. Mm, yeah. Sometimes we sometimes mash them short and hot, which gives you a little bit more residual um, unfermentables. So a little more weight on the palate. You can use more ingredients per unit of alcohol, which means especially when you get down to the the pale ales and stuff, we mash those pretty hot so that we can use. Five and a half or six percent worth of malt to only get to four and a half percent. Okay, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you're loading up on. So now you've got the malt flavor, but you're not getting the alcohol because we're trying to keep it at a like a sessiony yes. kind of tape, like under five percent or right around five. And um, and then also I love hops. I'm not crazy about dank hops. I'm not crazy about the West Coast floral cascade geranial driven hops. It's never been my thing. Mm. Uh, but fruity. Like citrus, okay, a little pine maybe, uh, but fruity, um, tropical, you know, all those are flavors I really enjoy, and I think they're lovely, and I think that, so for me, so it was like sort of like, oh, wait a minute, I should like these beers, because <laughs> you know, they're like, and the bitterness is lower, uh-huh. the bitterness is about maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of half of what you'd get in a conventional IPA, mm-hmm. so instead of being 65 to 70, you're at uh, 35 to 30, well, 30 to 35 or, or maybe 40. Uh, and that's just a much more enjoyable drink. It's not going to blow your palate out. Yeah. You know, because that bitterness is waxy and resiny and it gets on your tongue and it just sort of stays there. Yeah. You know, I've had beers that I've driven home from the bar and when I get home, I can still taste that hop, you know, on my tongue. Uh-huh. So. Um, uh huh. I, I look at it as a you know revolution. So you have the New England IPA revolution, then the counter revolution that was is, is brute IPAs, and it seems like all of it's taken place in about ten minutes. Um, yeah, <laughs> that I guess that's just kind of the nature of the way life is now. Things happen faster. Oh uh, yeah, I'm a little unconvinced by brute. I think it's a bit of a solution looking for a problem. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. Like if I was doing a brute, I'd love to be able to knock all the protein out of there and carve that up to like five volumes which is like double what normal beer is and really make a champagne thing out of it yeah um we do have one of my breweries we've got a hibiscus uh belgian like it's sort of a tr- pink triple with a lot of hibiscus and some ginger and uh um some other things and chamomile in there and we did that one brute this year uh and it's tasting really good it's almost like a pink champagne it's the hibiscus brings a lot of wine character into a beer so so we're pretty excited about that uh, so there's an example where we think the brood is actually working. But a lot of those brood IPAs, they just taste like kind of dry IPAs. And I don't know. It seems like they're losing a bit of their um, richness. And they just taste a little stripped down, a little, to me, a little boring. Yeah. You know, but that's just me. So. Yeah. I've had a couple. I've had I had one at a, at a homebrew store here in, in Houston that was really, really good. And then mm-hmm. I've had some others that were, you know, they were pretty good. But that one, uh, to me, was the best one. Just a... Yeah, yeah, you know, smaller. That that club and that shop is that that shop in Houston and that Foam Rangers club down there is like a thing of wonder. Oh, the DeFalco's and the and and, and Dixie the, Cup and the yeah and the Foam Rangers. So shout yeah. out to all the Foam Rangers that may be listening. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been down there. Well, one of the last times I was there, we did the Fred Eckhart tasting and we did molecular gastronomy Texas style. Yeah. So we had people in cryo suits walking through the hotel <laughs> with Dewar flasks of liquid nitrogen and stuff. <laughs> insane yeah it's you know i don't I always say people um well i i just think it's probably the same everywhere we're not on a, a chicago 150 brewery level uh some of the laws here in, in texas have been a bit detrimental to like we still can't do beer to go from breweries we're working on that this uh, yeah let yeah. only state right ridiculous yep but, um the but the beer scene here in houston i invite anybody that's you know has not people come through houston a lot and, yeah, uh, it's just, it's an international city, and uh, yeah. if you find yourself down here, man, the, the brewing scene down here has really rocketed up here in the last five, ten years. You know, it's just it's been- yeah, I can I can attest to that, and, and it's you know it's I, I like I like the place down there, I like the people. It's just kind of nuts. So <laughs> that's true <laughs> in a good way. There's like a great sense of humor there. It's uh, like a, I, for me, a lot of the rest of Texas takes itself just a little bit too seriously sometimes. So yeah, so Houston's really nice. Yeah, it's it's too hot to take ourselves that serious. Um, <laughs> I had a, a couple of questions. Some friends of me wanted to make sure I got your take on a, on a couple of questions. Um, one, I guess, you know, this is kind of the other side to the the new and the notable and the, the trendy. 
But uh, there's been, uh, I think there was a story out the other day on flagship beers and people mentioning, you know, our flagship beers on the way out are people, you know, are, should uh, a brewery still have a flagship beer? Um, you know, the sales are down for certain flagship beers and that sort of thing. What do, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a really complicated topic. Ideally, you'd like to have a flagship. You'd like to have a beer that's doing 50% of your volume or something, mm-hmm. as long as it's not too hard to brew and the profitability of it is good. But in the end, you know, you could take your best shot at what you think that beer's going to be, and then people will tell you what they want to drink. Yeah. You know, they'll tell you what they want you to make for them. So, you know, we've got one of my breweries, we've got one beer that's a, we've got really three beers that sell about 20% of our volume. And then we've got another one at 10 and then the rest of us seasonals. Um, you know, the other one, we've got a strawberry beer that is so far probably about half of our packaged beer sales, but doesn't come anywhere close to that at the brew pub. So, you know, I don't know. You just, you know, it's sort of a, like big companies will take years and spend millions of dollars and they'll go through this exhaustive process to do research and find out what's going to be the one big thing. And then they put it out and hopefully it'll succeed. Mm-hmm. doesn't always because, you know, by the time you get it out, you kind of miss the trend often. And so, but small breweries, like every beer is an experiment. Every beer is the cost of creating and launching a new beer is not that great. Uh, so we're kind of always sort of rotating stuff in and out. We just had a discussion yesterday. We got one beer that we've had regularly for probably about two years two and a half years and now we're going to pull that into a seasonal we got another beer on deck that seems like yeah maybe we'll do a little better with this one so we'll slide that in we'll bring the other one back as a you know maybe late summer seasonal or something so but you know people want variety Mm -hmm. and and that's the like that's both the blessing and the curse as a as a as a drinker it's an incredible blessing you can walk into the store and there's three thousand beers on the shelf Mm -hmm. as a brewer you're trying to get attention now there's 3,000 other beers on the shelf. So, you know, you have to, I think, especially in a market like Chicago, where you can't just open a brewery and make a pale ale and an IPA and a porter and a stout and a lager and whatever. You really have to kind of stand for something. Yeah. You have to decide what you're not going to do, what you, what you're really, what your mission is. Um, you know, you've got to have an idea behind you. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, because we have a really competitive culinary scene, same thing just applies right on over to the beer scene. So we've got chefs that have opened breweries. We've got, you know, we've we have our we have this Latin thing that we're doing at Five Rabbit. We have botanic brewing at Forbidden Root. Um, you know, there's people that specialize in in classic German styles and in, in like oddball German and other kind of wacky styles. So we've got a lot of really, and then of course people playing in saison and sours and wilds and cool ship beers and uh, you know. So we've got this great variety of of expressions you know that come from the people that are involved that in this dance that they do with the people that come to drink their beer and and hopefully you find some middle ground and if you have a hit great you know but those are getting harder to get because tap bars just buy like you're really lucky to keep one tap handle but it's rarely going to be the same beer yeah you know, unless you're selling beer into pizza places and family mexican restaurants where they got you know they'll put one beer on and and sell the hell out of it but you know to be one rotating brand on a 24 tap bar like how much beer are you ever going to sell in a place like that right right that much but you need to be there because those are the places to be and be seen and it's like the mark of quality to be on at the hop leaf in chicago or the map room or whatever you know everybody wants to be there uh, but everybody wants to be there so right it's uh you know it's an interesting like fascinating time you certainly got to have your a game and and be prepared to be super flexible and just keep spewing out ideas um so, somebody told me that uh, i think it was a distributor or a sales rep or somebody said first year out on a seasonal second year you're going to do half that volume hmm. just because which means it's... screw the screw redoing a seasonal just do a new seasonal every year yeah because that's the, what the, the market wants that novelty you know yeah no, that I, I can see that. that makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess you just have to, you know, adapt to the times. We all have to be uh, mm-hmm. nimble. Um, well, that's something we do. Yeah. 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 Um, and then one other question, another a brewer friend uh, is actually from Mississippi. He wanted me to ask uh, your opinion on um, how the we're currently at, I, I haven't looked at the news today. I assume we're still in a government shutdown. The uh, federal. Yes, government we are. Um, yeah. How has that affected uh, either you personally with the breweries or people that you've seen and how have you, is it, is it to a critical point yet? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, um, 
the the pinch point for most brewers is the government formula and label approval process. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- that's they've gotten that down to a pretty reasonable amount of time before the shutdown. I mean, they they rejiggered that whole program about a year ago and hired a ton more people and and it's because it used to take three four weeks to get a label approved and now they're down to three or four days. So it's really been amazing that so those guys are really. Uh, service oriented and they're they're trying to find ways to simplify the process and uh, so that's been awesome but right now nobody's approving nothing right. so we're okay we're shipping we've got beers that we kind of need we would like to get the label approval and we'll, we'll get it eventually we're shipping within one state and so it's not absolutely critical that we have that mm-hmm. uh, but if we want to ship some to Ohio or Florida or something they need that federal thing on the they, they need to have that to process the the registration of the beer in state. The the where people are getting creamed, I imagine, are people who are uh, have their brewery all set. They got people hired. They got equipment in place. They're waiting for the TTB to come and inspect and give them their license yeah. because otherwise they can't brew a drop. So they're they're paying all this money and sitting waiting on this shutdown. So there's probably. You know, my guess would be there's probably a hundred breweries or so that are in that position. Yeah. Uh, so, or one form or another of waiting for something really crucial from the TTB. So, but it ain't going to happen until the shut up, shutdown's over. So, yeah. But how much longer can that last? <laughs> <laughs> All bets are off in this world right now, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I think that'll be a, a, a good note to, to wrap up our conversation on. Um, the book, the new book, uh, how, how long until we can uh, expect to see that one? Uh, it's going to be a year and a half to two years. Okay. But the good news is I'm working on another one that uh, will probably come out about the same time. Okay. That's uh, focused on tasting, but in a much broader and much more highly practical kind of way. Okay. Almost like almost sort of like a field guide sort of thing. So. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, that'll be a giftable book for sure. Oh, um, yeah. The uh, also another giftable book, uh, Beer for All Seasons uh, by Randy Mosher. This is a great. I just love this one. I mean, the the visual and the you know, it's just a good beer calendar to have. Like, yeah, publish the publishers did a really nice job on that one. It's just a beautiful book. Yeah, and then of course, tasting beer. I think it's just it's in uh, Portuguese now. Is the latest language that it's been translated to? Uh, you know, we're not, we uh, we have a contract, but we just got this weird letter from the publisher, like, oh, uh, things are bad, and I don't know what's going to happen, and. You know, and we're like, why did they send us this letter? Because they didn't really say anything. But uh-huh. uh, so something's up down there. So we'll see what happens. Huh. Uh, Radical Brewing, we're getting in Portuguese. Okay. I'm going down. To, I'm going to Brazil. So if you're in, if you're in Brazil, I'll be down there uh, at the end of May and early June in uh, in uh, Rio and uh, São Paulo and uh, I don't know where we're we're going to. Uh, 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 Oh, I don't know. A bunch of places. <laughs> so look for me down there at Mondial and, and uh, uh, the beer uh, conference. So Okay. I'd love to have a conversation with you about the brew scene in, in Brazil at some point. But, uh, yeah, wait till I come back. We'll yeah. do that. Because okay. uh, I've been there. I've been a bunch of times. I've, I've helped uh, some breweries there with packaging and tossed a few ideas in. But uh, it'll be fun to see, despite all the economic woes that uh, they have in all over South America and Central America. There's so much enthusiasm for craft beer. It's just a sign of being part of the modern world yeah. and being civilized and, and a modern country. And people just absolutely want to have it. So, so it's really um, inspiring to see how much energy they put into this despite the terrible conditions and financial situations and exorbitant taxes and just like everything's against them, but yet they're making craft beer. So it's super cool. Yeah. Beer finds a way. Like, yep. It does. Just like Jeff Goldblum said, it finds a way. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Randy, thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast today and I look forward to talking again. This has been just a, a true honor to have you on, yeah. on my podcast. So, well, thanks for having me. I always appreciate the opportunity to get on the air and talk. So, All right. Well, open invitation anytime. Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Mosher uh, right here on Interbrews. So for Randy, I'm Josh. This is Interbrews. This is Interbrews. The preceding has been a presentation of Stewed Productions. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Interbrews. If you did... Hey, show us some support. Go to our Patreon page. Become a uh, Patreon supporter. And uh, there's exclusive interviews and episodes just for you. If you do that, if you've enjoyed the show, 
get a little more and help us go on for another seven years. It's been seven years. We want to go on for seven more. I guess that's a long time. 14 years for a podcast. Has anybody done that? I don't think so. Anyway, show your support if you'd like. We really appreciate it uh, a ton and uh, exclusive shows. So thank you in advance. And uh, we'll see you next episode of In a Bruise.